Good evening, Nicole Band. Thank you. Pastor Joey, thank you very much. I don't know whose that is, but that isn't mine. I'm not sure whose it is either. I, no, I don't know. But it's pretty talented that you could carry it out there and it not fall off. Because anybody couldn't do that, I promise you that. Praise the Lord. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. Yeah. Make sure that you go to church with your mother or your wife or your daughter or everybody's a daughter, so there's a lot of mothers too, so make sure that, and they have great, we have great gifts. I was telling at 9 a.m., if the gifts was a different color, they may be missing one. You don't want to miss your gift. It's, it's good. Uh, Pastor Jay, could you bring the microphone over to Pastor George? He and uh, Cindy have their 11th grandchild with them. And I, I want Pastor George to introduce his, his new granddaughter. Go ahead and, and show everybody that beautiful granddaughter. This is Briella. She's two weeks old, I think. Ten days, Ten days old. My 11th grandchild. Praise the Lord. Briella Grace. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Lord. Praise Lord. God, George. You better believe he's worthy of it. Keep on going, man. Praise the Lord. 11 grandkids. That's two hands plus one. Man, you don't look old enough to have 11 grandkids, George. I got four more uh, toes on my shoe and another foot. Praise God. Anybody have the gift of interpretation? I'll... Turn, turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. I want to read to you verse 20. I want to talk to you this morning about don't panic. Tell your neighbor, don't panic. Don't panic. Tell your neighbor, regardless of how bad it looks, don't panic. don't panic. Tell your other neighbor, don't panic. Don't panic. Some of you are not saying anything. Praise the Lord. I want to read this scripture and then I want to try to set it up if I could. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, it says, Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. That's 19. For, for, I, uh, for am I not in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. And I want to preach to you this morning about don't panic. And I'm here pretty much at the end of Joseph's life. But if you'll go back to, to chapter 37, I don't want you to turn there. I want you to go home and read it. I want you to read from chapter 37 through 50 and find out about the life of Joseph. But in chapter 37, you'll find that Joseph is, he's in a family and his brothers can't stand him. He has several brothers. His brothers hate him because he has the favor of his father on him. The word of God says that Joseph's daddy loved him more than all the other brothers. Everybody will not always understand the father's favor. Some people will hate you because the father's favor rests on you. Some people will despise you because the favor of the father rests on you. Praise the Lord. And it said that his brothers hated him because his father loved him more. Loved him so much that he made him a coat or a tunic of many colors. And it said also in that, in, in that chapter that Joseph had a dream. And it said that the first dream that he had, it said that the stalks of wheat bowed down to Joseph. Giving the indication of all the brothers were bowing down to him. He has a second dream, and not only did the wheat bow down, but now the sun, the stars, and the moons bow down to him. Giving the indication that mom, dad, and the brothers are bowing down to him. In fact, a nation so large that it's too numerous to even count is bowing down to Joseph. 
In this, in this chapter of 37, you'll find that Joseph's father now rebukes him. And then it said that the anger and the hatred of his brothers grew even greater toward Joseph, so great that they talked of killing him. And then it says as they contemplated killing him that they took him in the field and they threw him into a pit to determine what they were going to do with him. And then they decided to sell him into slavery. They sell him into slavery and he's put on the slave block, block, block to be sold and Potiphar from Egypt buys him and takes him as a slave to his house. Potiphar's wife is caught by Joseph. He, he, Joseph has now caught the eye of Potiphar's wife and she wants him if you know what I'm saying. Joseph says, no, I'll not do it. When Joseph rejects Potiphar's wife, she falsely accuses him of rape. They then take Joseph and throw him into prison for I don't know how many years. In the prison, he interprets some dreams. Now, in this passage of Scripture, because God gave him the ability to interpret dreams, he, he interpreted a dream of Pharaoh, was taken out of prison, and was put second in command of all of Egypt. This Joseph is over, has power and authority over all the grain in the world at this time. How easy would it have been for Joseph when he was down at the bottom of that pit to panic? And then he's taken into Potiphar's house as, as a slave, and now he's falsely accused of rape and thrown into prison. But it said whether he was in the pit, whether he was in prison, or whether he was in the palace, it said, and God was with him. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why Joseph did not panic is because he knew he had not just the favor of his biological father, but he had the favor of God the Father on him, for it said that he was with him. Now in this passage of scripture, it's a powerful scripture, Joseph's father has just died and his brothers were concerned now that Joseph was going to repay them for all the evil that they brought on his life. But then Joseph comes out with these uncanny words. He said, you meant it for my bad, but God meant it for my good. There was a bigger force in my life than what you could deal with, is what he is telling them. He said, there is a bigger call on my life than you could kill. Everybody will not be able to handle the favor that rests upon you. Everyone will not be able to handle the call of God that is upon you because the Father has his hand on you. But what you have to understand, even when you find yourself in adverse situations, you cannot panic. God had a plan for Joseph's life, and Joseph is saying it was bigger than me, but in the midst of me walking it out, I found God in this plan. And you have to understand, regardless of where you are, regardless of what you're going through, find God in the middle of it all. Even in the difficult times, find God in it. Joseph was able down at the bottom of the pit to find God at the bottom of the pit. Oh. This is good stuff. I'll just preach it to me. You all don't just, just, just clap every now and then and say amen and I'll just preach it to myself. Even when decisions were made for him, he was able to see God in everything. Man's decisions could not remove God's hand off Joseph's life. Oh, praise God. Man's decisions could not recall God's calling on his life. Don't panic. You're so afraid that someone's going to take something away from you. You're so afraid that someone is going to take something away from you that God gave you. And when God gives you something, no man, no woman, no devil in hell can take it away from you. You can give it up. But no one can take it from you. Yet we live in panic and fear that someone's going to take something that's mine. Not if God gave it to you. Don't panic. Did you realize that the, the, the most contributing factor, uh, the highest percentage of deaths in deep sea divers is due to panic? How many of you have ever been deep sea diving? One. <laughs> Two. Not me. I have no desire to go. But the number one cause of death in deep sea divers is panic. Do you know why? 
is because they catch a glimpse of a sea creature. And when they catch a glimpse of the sea creature, they get scared. And in the midst of their being scared and afraid, they lose their bearing. And as they lose their bearing, they frantically begin to swim. And what they don't realize, they are not swimming toward the surface. They're swimming deeper and deeper and deeper. Because they lost their bearing. They, in fact, they swim so frantically and so far, they do not have enough oxygen to get back to the surface, and they were driven by panic. The sad fact is, it was not a sea creature they saw, it was a shadow of a much smaller animal. Isn't it amazing when we walk through certain times and seasons and situations in our life how vast and large things really is? And in that midst of it seem very large and bigger than we are, we get in a state of panic. Instead of going to the surface where the air is, we just keep going deeper and deeper. Don't panic. How do we not panic in situations like this? How was it that Joseph did not panic? I've got four points of this message. I'm going to preach two of them to you. And how about I preach the other two tonight? The 9 a.m. shouted a whole lot louder than you did. No, don't try to make up for it now. (laughs) Number one, how do you not panic? Focus on your future. Focus on your future. Focus on where you're going. Regardless of where you are, regardless of what you're walking through, you have a God-given future. I don't care how old you are. I'm going to, I don't care. I'm going to get some old people stuff this morning. I'm tired of, of, of watching some of our senior saints mope around like they don't have a friend in the world, act like they don't have a call of God left on their life. I want you to understand, if God was finished with you, you would not be breathing today. Stop moping and stop pouting and start living because I need what you have to give. Joe, how old are you? 60? I'll be 68, May the It's the only man I know that brags that, hey, I'll be 68 in a few days. Wow. Most of us would be sucking every bit of life out of 67 that we could. <laughs> He's 68 years old. He's strong as an ox. In fact, this spring, he has to go and hide him because somebody's looking for him to put him in the garden and him plow up to him. But I've seen a lot of 68-year-olds. Do you know why? Because they have no future left. They thought the best days of their life are behind them. And you have to understand, if the best days of your life were behind you, you would not be living today. God has so much more for you, regardless of how old you are, regardless of how God got you. I don't want to hear whining and complaining about how, well, you know, I was born this way. Oh, oh, get over yourself. I don't care how you got here. I don't care if if, if you even got here because of sin. My God said he has a purpose and a plan for your life. I don't care how far someone tries to push you under a table. I don't care how they talk down to you. I don't care how they make accusations about you. I don't care how they talk about your lack of education, their lack of intelligence. I don't care. My God says, according to Jeremiah 29, 11, that he has a plan and a purpose for you. Talk about your future, not your past. You got to start telling yourself, I'm going somewhere. But you've got to step out of mediocrity. I'm going somewhere. Some of you need to start looking in the mirror and telling yourself that. I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. I was born for such a time as this in the kingdom of God. I could have been born in any other time in history. But God said, nope, I want you born now. I was standing down there this morning. Thinking about how blessed I am. And I stand around and I watch God just pour out. 
Watch people get healed. Watch people get filled with the Holy Ghost. Watch the lame begin to walk and throw their canes down. I watch God do the supernatural. I watch souls be saved. I see heroin addicts just delivered all at one time. And I talked to a friend of mine back north yesterday. He said, he calls me D. It's the first initial of my first name. He said, D, you've waited your whole life to be in a move of God like this. Maybe you don't want it, but I'm going somewhere. I've got a future ahead of me. I'm going to retrieve all that God has for me. How many of you is willing to go with me? I want all that God has. I don't want anything that God doesn't want, but I don't want anything falling off the table. I don't want one dog licking a crumb up off the table. I want to catch everything that God has. I want to walk in the fullness of his authority. I want to walk in the fullness of his might. I want to walk in the fullness of his power. Oh, I'm stirred up. The devil has tried for too many years to steal a future away from God's children. And do you not understand, the harder he fights, the greater the victory on the other side. Mm. I've got ground I haven't even walked on yet to walk on. It's the same destination, but God's taken me a new route. Neon signs and bright lights and the glory of God fall. It's the same destination, but it's a new direction. I love it in, 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 in Joshua. I love it in Joshua chapter 3, verse 3, where, where, where God says, now listen, he said, tomorrow when you see the Ark of the Covenant begin to move, he said, everybody begin to move with it. He said, but keep so, so many cubits distance between the Ark and the people because I'm going to take them in places they've never been before. And if they get too close, they'll miss when I turn and they'll keep on going. I love, I love that scripture God said, I'm going to take you a new direction. Nothing ever gets old with God. If it begins to get old, it's because you left him somewhere. He turned right and you kept on going. Because we got comfortable, we got set in our own ways. Don't you get comfortable. Just about the time you get comfortable, God will shake your box up. Praise God. Let me move on. <laughs> what is it that you're walking toward? Where, where are you going? Where are you walking toward? I'll tell you. Whatever you're looking at. Whatever the dominant image is in your mind, in your life, that's what you're walking toward. If you don't like where you're going, get a new image. Well, I, I don't know about that, Pastor. Well, read the Old Testament about Lot. It said that he set his tent, tent up and he was faced toward Sodom. And then the next thing you know, because he was facing towards Sodom, what he was looking at was Sodom. The next time it talks about him, he's now at the gate. A few verses later, he's no longer at the gate, but he's inside the city. Why? Because he started looking at it. Whatever you look at, you're walking toward. You're going to look at that short skirt, guess where you're going to end up? You start looking at drugs, guess where you're going to end up? If you have a godly mother and father, you better listen to every word they speak to you. Well, that was lame. You ought to be shouting right there. Whatever you look at, you're walking toward. If you don't like the direction your life's going in, get a new picture. Change it. You have the authority to change it in God, in Jesus' name. If you don't like where, hey, I, I've had to change my picture. I had poverty and depression all around me growing up. No, I'm not, I'm not a, listen, I'm a king's kid. I don't have to have poverty and depression around me. My God drives back depression. My God knows nothing about poverty. My God is just into blessing his kids and providing for his kids. Oh, 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 I know, I know you can't handle, I know you can't handle that. Oh, he's going into prosperity. No, I'm not going into prosperity, but I'll tell you what, my God is El Shaddai. He's more than enough. His children don't have to live in lack. But we bought into the lie, the enemy of, oh, well, you know, I've got to be humble. It's false humility. 
God wants his children blessed. He wants their children blessed. Yeah, how about you? Do you want your children blessed? I give, I, I've given my kids the best that we could afford to give them. Yeah, hey, let me get off that. You don't like that too much, so I'll go on. What is it that you're walking toward? Where's your, where, where's your life headed? Change the, change the picture. I want you to understand, Joseph, listen to this. Joseph had a future when he was at the bottom of the pit. When his brothers were speaking evil over him, his brothers were, 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 were talking about what they were going to do and making accusations. And Well, we, we could kill him or we could sell him. I don't know. Well, if, if we kill him, dad is probably going to find out. So, so maybe we'll just act like we kill him and sell him into slavery. So we're really going to kill him. And that way their actual blood won't be on our hands. And that's what they did. And he's listening to this the whole time. And the whole time he found God in the bottom of that pit. And God was with him. When he, was in, when he was on the slave, uh, slave, slave block, uh, he had a future. When he found himself falsely accused in prison, he had a future. Well, praise God. Situations and circumstances didn't change his future because he didn't allow situations and circumstances to change his focus. It's amazing how our future depends on what I'm walking through. I refuse to live like that. I refuse to allow situations and circumstances to dictate how I'm going to live and where I'm going to go. I, maybe I can't control my situations and circumstances, but I can control how I feel. I can control how I look at things. I can control how I process things. Oh, we don't like this. But I'm going to preach it anyway because that's what he gave me. Joseph had a future regardless of what he was walking through. When he was in the pit, he had a future. When he was in prison, he had a future. When he was in the palace, he still had a future. Now listen, focus on your future. Focus on where you're going, not necessarily where you are. Focus on where you're heading, not in what you're walking through. How many of you are walking through some stuff you'd rather not be walking through right now? Raise your hand. Raise it up real high. Put the other hand up. Now make me feel like you're praising God. See, I caught you. Won't you do that in worship? <laughs> Nicole, use that. Where's Nicole at? Use that next time. How many of you have kids? How many? How, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to her. You, well, go ahead. Raise them up. Raise them up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Come on. Raise your hand. Wave. You guys are the bomb. Now you all made me lose where I'm at, and I don't even know what I'm doing now. I'm thinking. I'm processing it. I'm trying to think. Focus on your future. Listen, we all have stuff we're walking through. Don't let it dictate where you're going. You'll be a roller coaster if you do. You'll get stuck in depression if you do. Don't get stuck in depression. Depression is not of God. His blood will drive the depression out of your life if you just focus on your future. Amen? The second point, the second way you don't panic is feed your faith. Feed your faith. How, how, how many of you uh, that was at the reception last night got a piece of that lemon cake? How many of you? Hallelujah. Was that stuff divine or what? You know what's messed up? That stuff was in my freezer for about three weeks, and I didn't know it was in my house. <laughs> Had I known it was in my house, there'd been less of them last night, I'll promise you. Then, then, then I'm, I'm at my own daughter and my new son's reception, and I go over. I, I, I just found the cake. I found the coffee. I knew where the coffee was because that was my idea. But then I found the cookies. I had a few of those. But then I saw cake over on the other table with cupcakes. Cupcakes are okay, but when I see cake that looks like uh, cheesecake, I'm all in. So I go over. I get a piece of this cake, and I take it back to the table, and my wife says, You're not supposed to eat that yet. I bought it. <laughs> I'll preach it over here, and you guys, pretty, you guys, be my rear guard, okay? I'm thinking I bought the cake. I should be able to eat the stinking cake anytime I want to eat the cake. She said, "Andy and Haley haven't cut their wedding cake yet. Well, they better hurry up, because I want cake." Where did I? Where am I going with that? What was it? Feed your face. Yeah, oh, I was feed, yes, feed, feed. I was eating the cake, and it was glorious. But isn't it amazing when we're fed something that we don't like, we have a tendency to spit it back out? 
Remember, have you ever had kids? You have kids? And remember, did you ever feed them spinach? Tried to. And what'd they do? They didn't work. <laughs> Spit it out, right? What'd you do? <laughs> Scooped it off their chin and shoved it right back in their mouth, right? <laughs> because you got to get them some nutrients. They don't know what they need. My God, this is good preaching. They don't know what they need. They need what that spinach has. So you cram it in their mouth. They spit it all over the place. You get the spoon, scoop it up off their chin. What do you do? Ah, it comes the airplane. Shove it right. You may have to open it up. Shove it right back in. Why? Because they need that. We don't always like what we eat. Let me put it this way. We don't always like what God feeds us. We have a tendency to spit it out, and then he just slaps it right back up off our chin and shoves it right back in our wife. Because we need that. There's something in that we need for survival. There's something in that we need for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We must learn how to feed our faith in that same way. How do you feed your faith? Listen to good reports. Praise God. Listen to good reports. You spend too much time listening to foul negative stuff. When someone gets saved, listen to that report. When someone gets healed, listen to that report. When someone gets delivered, find out what you can about how that happened. Listen to how God is moving and working in someone else's life. This is going to hurt. Make sure you're not the most important one in your life. Feed your faith. Learn how to find joy in in, in someone else's victory. Hmm. Let me try this another way. Learn how when someone else is blessed, you're blessed. Well... You know, so-and-so got a new car. Well, sooner you learn how to celebrate over their new car, maybe God can give you one. But until you do, until you're due, you're stuck with your, with your 75 Maverick. That was the first car that I drove. It was, they called it lime green, but it was actually snot green. It had rust all over it. And that's what I drove. You've got to learn how to be blessed when someone else is blessed. Because you see, when you learn how to, to walk in someone, when, when someone else is blessed, it has a tendency to feed back over on you. i got to go somewhere. Uh, J.D. and Nicole, you come, and we're going to try to close this thing out. I really don't have anywhere to go, but I know you do, and you've got to beat the Baptists. It's too late. The Baptists are already there. In fact, everyone's already there. <laughs> Except you. <laughs> Even the ones watching it on the internet, they're already eating in their living room right now. I caught you. I'm having fun this morning. Feed your faith. When you see someone else get bit blessed, let it stir you up. Man, that's getting me this morning. When you see someone else blessed, let it stir you up. Let it activate your faith. Let it feed your faith. There's certain people that God's placed in my life that that I just love to see their appearance. Because it feeds my faith. Joey Cavender is one of those people. I don't even have to see his face. Just let me hear his voice and know he's there. I don't know why he stirs my faith like that, but he carries a great presence of faith on him. But you're having trouble getting past his tattoos. (laughs) Oh, I'm going. Yeah, I am. You're having trouble. I I need a handkerchief to wipe my tears. You're having trouble seeing past the tattoos and and, and past the the, the, the sunglasses on the, the, uh, brother, the sunglasses go on your face, not your neck, but they're pointing backwards. (laughs) It's amazing how we stereotype things and say, oh, God surely can't be in that. You know, we're missing a whole lot of God because we're overlooking him because we can't get past a certain thing. 
you know, no, 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 no. Oh, you, you can't get past you can't get past a long hair. If the long hair wasn't bad enough, but he got it pulled up in a little little ball bun thingy back there. Not very many people can pull that off, but Joey Cavender can. If you have long hair, don't try that. You can't do it, but he can. I was thinking that if I could grow long hair, I could grow long hair, but it looks really bad. It looks just like an old mullet. Don't get any ideas. I was thinking the other day, I was thinking if I could grow hair like Joey Cavender, I'd grow it, pull it up in a little ball bun thingy, but I'd wear a suit with it and I'd look real sly. But I know my wife would never go for that, so I'm thinking, well, I can't do that. But you see, it's amazing what we can't get past to see God. Because we've got God so far down in the box that we have to go through all kind of junk just to, just to find him. But there are certain people that when I see them come on the scene, it just activates my faith. You need those people in your life. You need people, I, I preach this Wednesday, you need people in your life that will challenge you. They'll challenge you to walk a little bit closer with the Lord than maybe you would otherwise. Or maybe bring you up just a little bit higher than what you normally walk with the Lord. If you're not being challenged, your pond's too small. Many people want to be the big fish in your mud puddle. You go ahead. I want to, I want to, swim. I want to go in the ocean. Because you see, in that mud puddle, my, my growth is limited. But if I'm in the ocean, there's no limit to what God can do in my life. Praise God. Feed your faith. I'm supposed to be closing, aren't I? I'm trying. You need to be in the right atmosphere. This is, this is where I'll close. But it'll take me a while. Feed your faith. You need to get in the right atmosphere. You see, when you're in the right atmosphere, it feeds your faith. If you'll be honest... There is no one that is sitting in this room right now that when you leave cannot say that your faith was fed because you've been in an atmosphere where faith has been activated and God's been moving and it's fed you. Now, you may not want to admit it, but it has been. You can tell people it hasn't, but you know. Because there's been times somewhere along the way that you smiled, even though, old prude face, you didn't want to smile. Somewhere you kind of <laughs> grinned a little, except for the babies. They're crying. They're missing lunch too. They're, Baptists have beat them too. <laughs> but the right atmosphere will feed your faith. And you see, that's why when, now listen to me, hear my heart in this. When, when, when the Holy Spirit is moving, when, when the Holy Spirit is moving in, in a church service, and, 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 and can I just be real with you? Thank you. The, when, when, when LaShonda came up here and the Lord healed her uh, from, from where, where she wasn't able to walk for seven days and all at once she could just let go of the cane and she walked clear around the sanctuary, if you were in need of healing, you should have been right there in that atmosphere. Fact of the matter, you should have been following her as she walked. But pride keeps us from doing that. When what you have to understand, there was an atmosphere being released. There was an atmosphere being cultivated right there. Jump in the atmosphere. I'll close by 1230 maybe. Which we like the right atmosphere. See, we've been talking a lot lately, been preaching a lot lately, that everywhere a Christian shows up, the atmosphere should be transformed. It should change. Yes, I know. It's humble to think. But yes, the, the fact of you walking in the room should change the atmosphere in a good way. Bill Johnson put it this way. The Holy Spirit is in me for me, but he's upon me for you. Meaning that everywhere I go, not only is he in me, he is resting on me. That everywhere I go, he transformed the atmosphere around me, around me because of what I carry. It's not the human being. It's always the Holy Spirit. What will it be like? How many of you remember, how many remember in the New Testament when Peter, as he passed by the sick, it, said as his, it, it says that as his shadow fell on the sick, they were made whole. How many of you remember that? How many of you would like to see that happen? How many of you would like to have the Holy Spirit rest upon you so strongly 
that you just walk into a room and boom, they're up. I, 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 I want to be, be the one in the hospital that I watch someone walk down the hallway and the Spirit of God rests upon him in such a mighty fashion that as they pass by door after door, I watch the people in the hospital beds get up and follow them outside of the hospital. In fact, I'll go a step further and say, I want, to, I want the Holy Ghost on me so strongly, I want to be so saturated. I want to marinate so long in the presence of God. Oh, I'm going to. So long in the presence of God that I can walk into a funeral home for visitation. But walk out in celebration of knowing the dead was just raised. Oh, I know. Maybe it's too much for Sunday morning. But that's what I was created for. For too long the church has made excuses why we can't, why we shouldn't. Put your excuses in the box and burn it. But walk in the fullness of faith that God has called and created you to walk in. It's establishing that atmosphere. That atmosphere of faith. Man, when you, when you see people, when you see one person begin to stir up the faith, you see someone else come alongside of them. And then another person, another, but you see it almost every service. It's an atmosphere of faith being stirred, being cultivated. Mm. His presence, his presence activates faith. I would rather have his presence than a gift. I'd rather have his presence than a blessing. <laughs> see this see this watch this watch is is a present it's a gift. My wife gave it to me for our 20th wedding anniversary. It's a Movado. I, I, I wanted one my, ever since I started liking watches. And, and this is my favorite watch, and she bought it for me for my 20th anniversary. But I'll tell you this, I'd give this away in a heartbeat if I could just have her presence. Because you see, if I have her presence, I don't have to worry about being blessed. I'm automatically blessed because I have her presence. And why should I be so consumed about what kind of gift I have? If I have the king, I've got every gift. That... Mm. So I would rather have her presence than a gift I can wear on my hand. Is this making sense? I love this woman of God. I love her. I would rather have her presence. I'd rather have her presence than a gift. I'd rather have her presence than a blessing because if I have her, I've got it all anyhow. (laughs) See, the same is true with God. Many people are just seeking after the hand of God, the blessing of God, a gift from God. Oh, I want his presence. Think about Esther and how she soaked in oil for all those months, perfume and all those months, just so she could go in to be with the king. I want to be so marinated in his presence that every time I show up into a room, the whole atmosphere shifts. I want the presence of God so strongly on me that when I walk through Walmart and people are are standing in the aisle looking at milk, they just start overcome with the sense of presence of God. They start weeping and, 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 and they fall to their knees and say, oh, Jesus, I need you. Well, Holy Ghost just showed up right there. I'm serious as I can be this morning. And if you can't handle it, you need to start handling it. Because I'm not changing. And you see, see, this is the thing with, with church folk. I still have four minutes. See, this is the thing with church folk. Is that we can handle it in Walmart. And we could even handle it in a hospital. Might be sketchy, but I can handle it at the funeral home. We have difficulty handling it in church. Because we want to control him. We want to be able to pull the rein back on him when he gets a little out of hand. I don't hold reins in my hand. I want all that he has. Because in that atmosphere, my faith is stirred. 
to believe for the impossible. In that atmosphere, my faith is stirred to achieve and receive what only he can give to me. Stand to your feet and give God a hand clap of praise this morning. <clears throat> One of the ways that your faith is stirred is read the Word of God out loud over yourself. Read the Word of God out loud over yourself. Make those proclamations openly. This morning, this morning, if you're walking through one of those difficult times and you, you're leaning lately more along the lines of panicking than you are walking it out in faith, I want you to get around this altar this morning. And in an atmosphere of faith, allow God to cultivate all that He has for you. Allow Him to transform your thinking. Allow Him to transform your mind, the way you're looking at things. Your perception's messed up. Things are not as bad as they look. You need to step in the full, the fullness of faith that God has for you. Maybe your focus has been a little obscured lately. Get around this altar. If your heart's far from God. Come get around the altar. If you're having financial issues, get around the altar. If you're having kid issues, get around the altar. Having issues with a friend, get around the altar. Having issues with your spouse, whatever it is, you bring it to him this morning. Come and feed your faith. Let him stir, let him stir the gifts of God up that he's placed in you. It says the prayer, of the, it says, it says the, the prayer of faith will save the sick. So this morning, you come. Go ahead, Nicole. You go ahead and sing. And you come. As the Lord leads you, you come. If there's a need in your body, I want you to come. You come. Faith needs stirred. You come. Some of you, your faith has grown cold. Your prayers have grown quiet. You used to walk real close with the Lord. There was a speed bump somewhere along in your life. You stopped praying the way that you used to. You, you stopped carrying faith the way you used to. And God's brought you here this morning to reactivate that faith. So you come. If there's been distance between you and the Lord. You come to Him this morning. Surrender your heart to Him. Just, just bow your heart to Him. Let Him move. that's here this morning that you've had an interruption in your ministry I'm just going to do my best to follow the Holy Spirit in this you've had an interruption in your ministry and your faith has grown cold 
And if that's you this morning, if there's been an interruption in your ministry, if, if there's been a aspects of your ministry, areas of your ministry that's begin to grow cold, I want you to get around this altar and allow God to, to cultivate that faith on the inside of you. You come and just cry out for that faith to be stirred up on the inside of you so that that ministry glows like a red hot coal like it used to. If you don't burn for the Lord quite like you used to, come on. It's time to burn again for the Lord. Time is short. The kingdom of God is at hand. There's something about ministry. I, I don't know what it is, but there's, there's something about ministry and, 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 and whether it was a calling that was laid down or, or, or whether someone told you you were no longer fit for ministry. Someone suffered a setback in ministry. Come on. Lord's calling you now. He's calling you. Re, re-engage in, in, this, in this calling that he has for you. Allow God to breathe on it again. My God, when God breathes on it, don't you know it comes to life again? Yes, yes, yes. I don't care how dead you think it is. I don't care how dead somebody told you it was. When my God breathes on it, dead things come to life. So you, so you come. Go ahead, Nicole. You come. Get in this atmosphere of faith. Let him stir on the inside of you. Come on, let's sing that with her. to us. Yes, you are, Daddy. My Daddy. My Daddy. My Daddy. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Worship the Lord a little bit. Can you just worship Him? Right in this atmosphere, just worship Him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Father, we just come right now in the name of Jesus. And Daddy, we just thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your blessing. Oh, but Daddy, most of all, I thank you for your presence. Lord, I thank you that you've settled down in this house this morning. Lord, I pray that we would soak up everything that we can that's of you. Lord, I pray that you would lead us. I pray you'd help us. I pray you would guide us this day. Lord, I pray that we would enjoy our journey today, that we would not allow our focus to be obscured by, by shadows that aren't real. Father, may we only be captivated by you and your goodness. May our thoughts only rest upon the things that are good and pure and holy. So Father, I pray that you would just strengthen us right now. I pray that we wouldn't look at any obscurity. I pray that we wouldn't listen or look at anything negative. We wouldn't look at question. We wouldn't look at doubt. But Lord, that our faith would be stirred in such a way that we would only set our eyes, we'd only set our attention, our gaze upon what is of you, Father. So Lord, I pray that you would just be with everyone in this house right now. I pray you'd be with all the ones that's receiving ministry and prayer around this altar. I pray you'd be with everyone as they travel to their home this afternoon. Father, I pray that you just give your angels charge over them and give them traveling mercies. We thank you for this time, Father. And Lord, I pray you bring us back together tonight just to see what you desire to pour out on your children. We thank you for it, Jesus. And we ask it in that name. And amen. Thank you for coming this morning. We'll see you tonight. May the Lord bless you today.